Hey guys, my name is Tensor. Welcome to another intro to Dart tutorial video. Today we're going to be talking about concurrency. This means asynchronous programming and parallel programming. And we're going to be looking at the different tools that Dart gives us in service of these types of programming. Back in the mid 2000s, hardware developers ran into a bit of an issue. So when they were creating CPUs, they were able to speed them up only to certain speeds. And then they found that they couldn't really make them faster. And so what they decided to do was start to add more CPUs onto the single board. So I'm sure that 99% of you who are listening to this video have a multi-core processor in whatever device you're using, whether it be your phone, your computer, or your tablet. Adding multiple processors to a processor chip doesn't just speed up the processor chip unless you know how to fully take advantage of having that second processor there, you really don't get any performance boosts. What this essentially means is that the CPUs can perform more than one task at the same time. So first let's take a look at what's called asynchronous programming. Asynchronous programming is for when a result of a computation is passed back from an asynchronous task. This means that the task doesn't have a specified time frame for which it's going to end in. Examples of this are, for instance, if you were to ping to a web page, because the web page is outside of the internal program that you're running, you don't know whether or not the web page is going to come back with data, and you don't know when it's going to come back with data. Another example of this is if you read from a file on a computer, you have the virtual machine which is running your program, and the program is decoupled from the operating system. So you don't know whether or not the file is there, and you don't know how long it will take for you to read the file depending on the file size. If you take a look at this program, we have three print statements. Everything will execute from the top all the way down to the bottom and each one will execute one at a time. So this will print out first, then this will print out, and then this will print out. And we would get them back in the order that we predicted. Imagine that we had a line of code here between these two print statements that had to access a file or maybe access the internet. The problem is, if this was a synchronous line of code, it would essentially block this code from running and any code after it from running until it completes. This would print out, then this would print out, then this would go and try and access the internet or the file. It would then potentially fail or it would take a few seconds maybe, and then finally we would get this printout. If this line, however, is asynchronous, then these will execute. This will go ahead and start the execution. This will execute, and then after this finishes executing, it will then come back with its result. And so even though we're running all of this on one single thread of execution, that is to say that we're not running everything parallel to one another, we can kind of jumble around how things execute and make it so that asynchronous code will finish execution in a way that makes sense. For asynchronous code, Dart has what are called futures, and to access futures, we want to go ahead and import a part of the standard library called Dart async, and you can just import it by typing in import Dart colon async. Importing this library gives us access to the future object and the asynchronous key as well as some other tools. So here we have an asynchronous function. And I've specified that this function is asynchronous by putting in this keyword after the function declaration and before the function body. And what this is telling the compiler is that it will return with a future and that future will wrap some other type. And that type could be anything from null or it could be like a collection or it could be like a string. Internally, every future uses what's called a completer and the completer will complete its execution when the future comes back. So we can manually create our own completer here. And then we can go ahead and create a future object by using the future delayed name constructor. This takes in a duration, and we're going to pass in a duration of two seconds. And then it takes in a closure, and our closure is just going to call to our completer and call complete, and then pass in a string 
that just says delayed call. So now we've created a future that wraps a string and then we can pass back that future by going return completer dot future and that will return a future with a string wrapped inside of it and the string will be this string right here. Now because we've used future delayed this will wait two seconds before it actually returns to the main function. Now in our main function I've created a bunch of print statements. So I've got a print statement that says program start and then I've got a print statement that will print out our execution of this future function that we just created and then I'll have another print statement that will print out that the program ended. When I execute this notice that we print out program start then we print out instance of future dynamic and then we print out program end. Now the problem here is that we're not taking the future object that we're getting back here and grabbing the string that's inside of it just by calling print future like this. If we want to unwrap the future then we have two main ways of doing it. The first way is using the then method and then passing in a anonymous callback function which will take the value inside of the future and then do something with it. And all this is really doing is it's saying all right when this future completes we then want to unwrap the value from the future object and then print it out. So now when I run the program you can see we get program start, program end and then after two seconds we get back delayed call. So even though we declare that we want to print out this future right here in our code, because it is a future and because it is asynchronous, it doesn't happen until the completer comes back with the future. Now let's say for instance that we want to be able to unwrap the future and we also want to set up the code so that it will run like synchronous code. We can use the await keyword for this. To use the await keyword we need to make the outer function into an asynchronous function. So our main function is now asynchronous and that allows us to use this await keyword. What this essentially does is it will force it to print out program start. Then it will wait for this future function to complete and then it will print out the delayed call statement and then it will move on to the program end statement. So as you can see here it's waiting two seconds and then it prints out delayed call and then program end. I mentioned before that all futures automatically have completers inside of them. So we do not need to use the completer like this every time. In fact it's not very common that you would use a completer like this unless you were building something very specific. So down here I've created two new functions. Both of them are going to return futures with strings inside of them. We have event one where we just create a future with the future value named constructor and then we just pass in a string that says this is a future event and then we have event two where again we use future value and then we pass in another string that says this is another future event. Up in our main function Let's create some calls to our new function. So we have future, then we're calling then, taking the value inside of the future and then printing it out. Then we have event one and event two and we're doing the same thing for both of these. And you'll see that none of these executions are guaranteed in order when we actually call our program. So here we get program start and then program end. Those are our two synchronous calls. Then we get back this is a future event which is event one and then this is another future event which is event two and then finally we get back the future call which is the delayed call. To really understand what's going on here we kind of need to look at the way that Dart executes things. When a Dart program starts its execution it moves down two different queues. It tries to see if there's anything inside of these queues. It has what's called the microtask queue and first it checks to see if that microtask exists. If there isn't one then it'll move on to the event queue and again it'll check to see if there's an event in the event queue and if there isn't one then it will just end execution. The three functions that we're executing are all considered events. The event queue goes and it executes all of our asynchronous functions and then it 
sends them back when they're complete. So if you notice when we ran our code here, event one happened before event two because there's no real delay here, but future happened after these two because future took two seconds to complete. As you saw in the graph, we also have what are called microtasks. Now I'm not really going to go into detail on microtasks, but suffice to say that you can schedule one by calling to a global level function inside of Dart called schedule microtask and then passing in a function. So here I'm calling schedule microtask and then we're just going to print out that this is a microtask. And the only thing you guys really need to keep in mind with regards to microtasks is that they take priority over events. And as you can see, we get program start, program end. This is a microtask. Then this is a future event. This is another future event and then the delayed call. If we want to assure the order of execution, again, we can use the await keyword like I mentioned before. And this even applies if you have multiple futures. So here we have our future event. Then we have event one and event two. So future will finish execution before event one and event two finish execution. So again, always use the await keyword if you need to make a synchronous code act like synchronous code. Everything that we've executed up until now has been concurrent code, but what happens if we want to run things in parallel? I'll remind you that parallel code is code that runs on more than one processor, whereas concurrent code is just code that is potentially asynchronous that can run on multiple processors. With Dart, we have what are called isolates. In Dart, isolates are a bit like threads, except they don't share memory with one another. The best way to really think about isolates is to sort of think of them as though you're spawning multiple programs, and then you're having each of the programs talk to one another using messages. So it's almost like we have multiple main functions that are executing in parallel when we spawn a bunch of isolates. To gain access to isolates inside of Dart, we have to use the Dart isolate library, which we can import like we did with our Dart asynchronous library. We can spawn an isolate using a function called spawn, and this function takes in two parameters. The first one is a function that we want to spawn with the isolate, and then the second one is the object that we want to pass to that spawned function. So here we have a function that is called messenger, which takes in a string, and all it does is take that string and print it out. And then inside of our main function, we're spawning a new isolate using isolate spawn, passing in our messenger function, and then passing in the argument that we want to pass to this messenger function. So this will spawn an isolate and then execute this function with this as the message string that's being passed to it. Then afterwards, we have a print statement that just prints out that this is from the main function. Now when running this short program, the from main print string may print before the this is from the isolate statement. And this sort of weakly proves that these two functions are running in parallel. Let's look at a more complex example of using isolates. So I'm going to create a function here called calculate pi. And what we're going to do is calculate the number for pi using a isolate outside of the main function. To communicate with isolates, we're going to need ports and we're going to need what's called a send port to send to the isolate and then a receive port to receive messages back from the isolate. So in this case, we're just going to send in our send port and then the isolate will then be able to use it to send the messages back to main. Let's go ahead and look at our calculate pi function. We've got an integer here called iters. This is the amount of iterations that we want to go through. The higher this value is, the closer to pi we'll get. Then we have some doubles that we want to set up. We have s, which will start at 1.0. Then we have den, which will start at 3.0. And then we have neg, which will start at negative 1.0.
We then go through a for loop, which iterates from zero all the way up to our iterators number. And we take s and we add the value of negation, which is our negative number, times one divided by our denominator, which is this 3.0 at first. Then we take our denominator and we increment it upwards by 2.0. So this will go three, five, seven, and so on. And then we take our negative number and we multiply it by negative one. So it'll be negative one, then one, then negative one, then one, and so on. Then so that we can see the progress of what's going on here, we have a little if statement that says if i divided by our iterators is equal to 0.25, or if i divided by our iterators is 0 0.05, or if i divided by our iterators is 0.75, then we want to grab our send port and send back a string where we take i, divide it by our iterators, and then multiply it by 100, and then that will be the percent complete that we are through this algorithm. Outside of the for loop, we then want to calculate pi by multiplying s by four, and then we can send it back to our main isolate using the send port send method. Up here in our main function, we need to create a receive port because we're going to receive data from our isolate. Then we'll listen on this receive port and we'll give it a callback function which will execute every single time we get back data from the receive port. First, we'll check to see if the data is a string. And if it is, then we just want to print that data out. This will just be the progress that we're making on calculating pi. Otherwise, we want to print out that pi is, and that's the data that we got back, because this will be a double rather than a string. And then we want to close our receive port. Finally, we want to spawn the other isolate, and we can pass in calculate pi and our port send port, which is the send port side of the receive port. So now if I go ahead and execute this, you can see we're at 25%, now we're at 50%, now we're at 75%, and then finally we get back the number that we've approximated as pi, which is 3.14159265454 and so on. And this is pretty close to pi, which is pretty cool. And of course, we could keep adding numbers to our iterator to make it more and more accurate. This is a good example of using an isolate because generally you'd want to use a parallel isolate with computation heavy algorithms like this. One thing to keep in mind, however, is that an isolate outside of the main isolate can only communicate to the main isolate in one way. So we can only receive messages from an external isolate, but we can't send messages to an external isolate. So there's no way for us to send from the main isolate to our calculate pi isolate. Instead, we can only receive messages in this case. If we wanted to send data from main to our calculate pi, then instead of sending in a send port, we would send in a receive port object. But again, we wouldn't be able to get back any data from our calculate pi isolate and then use it inside of main later. Keep in mind that Dart itself is a single threaded programming language. It's single threaded in the sense that unless you spawn isolate objects, you are using a single thread, and that thread is going through that execution loop that I showed you before. When you do spawn an isolate, you're spawning another instance or another thread that the computation can run through in parallel with the original single thread. All right, guys, well, I hope you enjoyed this tutorial. Anyway, if you like this tutorial, feel free to subscribe and like. If you have any questions or comments, feel free to leave them in the box below. And if you dislike this tutorial, then by all means, downvote it as much as you like. Have a good night.